Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Julie turned to face me as she reached the door. Thanks, Brayden. Will I see you tomorrow? You bet. She stood on the tips of her toes and kissed me softly on the cheek. Her scent lingered for just a moment as she spun around and made her way into the hallway. I watched her bums sway back and forth as she made her way to the elevator. She was a beautiful young woman. There was no doubt about that. She turned and gave me one little wave before she was gone. As soon as I clicked the door to my condo shut, she started. A little young for you, don't you think? I paused, staring at the back of the door, wishing for a moment that there was a mirror there so that I could see the look on my own face. I waited, but it didn't come. Maybe it was finally over. Maybe I had finally moved on. I searched for the anger, but it wasn't there. Well, she is young, Melanie. I wouldn't know about the rest. I turned and walked past her without bothering to give her a second glance. I walked into my loft and toward the kitchen suddenly feeling the need for a drink. I opened the fridge to take a quick inventory. There were the fruits and vegetables I liked. The chicken breast thawing for the dinner I was no longer in the mood to make. Yogurt, milk, energy drinks and beer. I grabbed one, just one, of the seven bottles left from the case that I had purchased almost a month earlier. It was a far cry from the pace I had set during the first year after my divorce. I heard her following me. The click of her heels the exact opposite of my bare feet. I opened the bottle and set it on the sparse stainless steel countertop. I opened the cabinet door to place the bottle cap in the trash, exactly where it should go. Everything was in its place. Like it always was. Orderly. Neat. Clean. I made my way to the living area, crossing an invisible line delineating the large open spaces. Kitchen, dining room, office, bedroom, gym, living room. The furniture was all top of the line but could never be confused for a matching set. The living room was no exception. Two stiff black leather lounge chairs on one side, separated by a metal end table and crystal-based lamp. The chocolate leather oversized love seat was next, fronting a huge 60-inch LCD and a glass-topped wooden coffee table. But the recliner was my favorite. Plush tin leather, big enough to hold my 6 feet 4 inches frame. It was definitely comfortable enough to sleep in. Nothing matched, but nothing looked out of place. Each piece called to me when I purchased it. Everything had a story. Everything was me. So it fit. Everything except her. Not even going to offer me a drink? It was the first time I really stopped to look at her. She showed up unannounced. It was the first time I had seen her in eight years. I was honest enough with myself to admit she looked good, beautiful even. But, then again, she always had the looks. It was her other qualities that I had trouble with. I wouldn't want you to get the impression that your presence was welcome. You're not my guest. If you want something, you can find it yourself. I watched her spin on her heels and head back to the kitchen. I had missed that bum. It was perfect, after all. She knew it, too. Which is why, as she was at that moment, she most often wore a skirt that said, Yeah, I know you're looking. I allowed my eyes to wander from her sexy bum to her long, toned legs, to the straps around her ankles, to the four-inch heels of what had to be her very expensive shoes. I let my primal urges rule the moment as I imagined her bending at the waist was more for my pleasure than to search for whatever she was looking for. I was waiting for the longing to set in, a reminder of the pain and heartache that always came with being forced to look at something that wasn't yours anymore. Something that had been taken. Stolen. Lost. What I felt instead was something altogether different. Pride. Maybe. It was definitely more of a yeah, I've screwed that kind of a moment. She returned having found her signature wine glass and Chardonnay. Her eyes were calm, coolly hiding her true intentions. For the first time that I could remember that realization didn't frighten me. You look good, Brayden. I feel good, Melanie. The chess match had started, and it felt good to not be on defense right from the outset. You're not even going to ask me why I am here? You're not even a little bit curious. It's not that I'm not curious. A person can never have too much information. Her telltale smirk told me that she thought we were on even ground. It's just that I don't give a shit. Even in the most surprising situation, Melanie had an uncanny ability to maintain her poker face. I had first-hand knowledge of that fact, so it felt good to see her slight wince, even if it only lasted a second. She turned to face my wall, an 18-foot length filled with a framed pictures of my journey. It was a floor-to-ceiling reminder of how I had gotten here and the lessons that I had learned. Rock bottom. That's the name for it. I had heard it mentioned. I certainly had never felt it. But that is where I started. Right after Melanie divorced me and destroyed my life. I won't lie and say that ours was the perfect marriage. It wasn't. 
We struggled mightily in the beginning, mostly because we didn't have any more than 20 extra dollars between us at any given moment. Still, we were young and hopeful and impulsive and committed. Our marriage didn't fail early on because we didn't believe that was even possible. After all, soulmates never gave up on each other. So memories and moments were created, like searching for loose change in the couch so that we could scrounge up enough to split a fast food meal and have enough left over to share a cupcake on our first anniversary. Or the time we made our first Christmas ornaments from paper and crayons and hung them on the fake tree that we found in the trash behind our apartment. When Melanie had them laminated before our second Christmas, I loved her even more. And more every year we placed them on the tree. Still, even when you love someone, they can be annoying. Melanie had a habit of reorganizing things. She'd remove and replace all of the utensils in the kitchen or the spices in the rack or everything in the hall closet in a pattern that only made sense to her. Just when I had gotten used to the new configuration, she would do it again. It was a small thing and wouldn't have even been a thing, except that once she was done, she couldn't remember where anything was. Han, where are the scissors? In the drawer somewhere. They're not where they were last week. Did you move them? Probably. I can't remember. Just keep looking. They're here somewhere. I would often have to go and buy a replacement of whatever was missing if I needed it with any urgency. Sometimes it would be weeks before things showed back up, and we were broke, so any extra expenditure was a problem. So, yeah, it was little annoying. More often than not, though, I never thought about our lack of funds, though. Probably because of the sex. I only had a heart on any time she was in the room. She was as insatiable as I was. If we had five minutes alone anywhere, at any time, we were more often than not in a state of undress. I loved the sound of desperation in her voice when I was holding out on her. Then, after her arch bums fell back to the earth, I would stare at her exhausted body and watch her while she recovered. She was perfection with a slight sheen of sweat on her gloriously tanned skin. Her body was young and soft and voluptuous, an impossible combination. And I loved her looks. The one that announced long before her clothes came off that I was getting laid was my favorite. The sex was amazing. And I never tired of her crystal blue eyes. Memories. Those were the important things. After the dust had settled on our divorce and I had placed the cap back on the bottle, I had my first epiphany. Those hard years, when we never knew where the money for next month's rent would come from, showed me that, together, we could survive even the worst situation. For Melanie, they were a nightmare, never to be lived again. At any cost. I watched her peruse my collection. Her eyes gave her away with double takes at the photographs of places we always said we would visit together, back when our dreams were impossible but shared. She was the epitome of walking sexuality. The glass dangled in her fingers, the wine swirling to match the sway in her bumps. When she tipped her head to look up at the pictures on the top row, her shoulder-length blonde hair draped across the shoulders of her silk blouse, opening the view to the gentle sweeping lines of her neck. The very neck I had dreamed of strangling so many times. I guess it's true. You really traveled to all those places. I did. She was watching me again as if she was trying to anticipate my next move. Unfortunately for her, I didn't have one. You've changed. Oh, I doubt that is true. In fact, I know it's not true. I am the same man I have always been. Perhaps with just a little more me and a lot less you. See, that's what I mean. You never would have said things like that to me before. Life is full of things we want to say, plan on saying, and dream about being able to say and remaining silent. We get lost in that silence or we lose the person we should be. Are we pretending to be someone we are not? I had spent a lot of time looking for that answer. I finally decided we try to be the person we think we are until someone shows us our reflection in the mirror and we can no longer maintain the lie. Some get over the shocking truth better than others. Maybe. That smirk had returned. I knew it. So what's different now? There is nothing more of mine you can take. We are not connected in any way. And that means you can't hurt me anymore. She started to speak, a lump catching in her throat. I wanted to believe that she was moved, but I didn't. Not even a little. I want you to make it stop. I didn't start it. But you could end it. I'm not certain that is true. Though, even if I could, I am not certain I would. You're enjoying this. Not particularly. I have very little interest in a constant reminder that the person I loved most in the world was a lying, cheating witch. I am not sure why. It's not like I had said anything that she hadn't heard before. But I could tell that this time it had stung, if only just a bit. And besides, I am smarter now. Never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake. Sun Tzu. Napoleon. 
I had been woefully unprepared for the total devastation that had been hurled upon me during our first conflict. I wasn't prepared this time either, but fortunately, I also wasn't alone. The rumors had started months earlier. People were whispering everywhere I went. The economy was tanking, a job, any job, was worth its weight in gold, and layoffs were on the horizon. Walking the factory floor was bad enough, with eyes following my every move, people stopping me when they thought no one was looking, asking me if I had seen the list. But I was getting it much worse at home. Melanie was near panic, asking me, every day, if I had heard anything. Did I still have a job? Was I sure? What was my plan? What were we going to do? I didn't have a plan. I didn't need one. My boss was a good man, and he had my back. He had looked me in the eye, and told me not to worry. So I hadn't. And it would have been fine, if he had been the one making the final decisions and other people hadn't intervened. If there were signs, I missed them. There were some possibilities. I recognized after it was much too late. Our sex life had taken a noticeable dip. I thought it was stress. I knew I wasn't in the mood as much as I had been before. I guess I thought it was my fault more than hers. Then there was the fact that Melanie knew, before I had stepped one foot into the house, I had been laid off. My boss was dumbfounded as he told me that the man with the highest team production and best quality rating was lost from his staff. Melanie wasn't even surprised. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be my only long-term commitment that was about to get blown to hell. Melanie gave me absolutely no hint that our marriage was in trouble. She went through the motions of a dutiful wife with ease. Loving embraces, kisses on the cheek, keeping me well-fed and the house spotless. She was so much more of a Susie homemaker during those last few weeks. She never let me leave the room without telling me she loved me, probably to mask her guilt. I was served while waiting in line for my turn to access the company-sponsored outplacement resources. I came home to find the locks changed, my clothes boxed and in the driveway with another copy of the restraining order placed neatly on top. My severance package should have lasted for months, but I was almost immediately forced to choose. Should I use my remaining funds to fight the divorce and for custody of my daughter or to live? I chose to fight, but I was simply outmatched. Lawyers, psychologists, judges all came to the same conclusion. I was a mentally abusive, unfit parent. I was unemployed and without means to care for a child. I was worthless. They said so in writing. All legal-like. The final blow came when I had my last harebrained idea. If I could just speak to April face to face, she would listen to me. At the time, she was nine. Old enough to tell them that she loved her daddy and that she wanted to see me and that we were like peas in a pod. And so I stood in the darkness, behind the bushes, hoping to see her. Staring at what used to be my house. That was the first time I saw them together. My wife, my daughter, and the company vice president of operations. He was the son of my former company's founder and a womanizer, an a-hole and perhaps the worst business manager ever to hold an executive position. But his old man was respected and people were loyal and the only ruined life was mine. And I was a nobody. They had all said so. He was a strange-looking man, ten years my senior, with an expanding waistline, a large checkbook, and my pre-made family. I would be the first one to admit that my description was biased by my hatred. He wasn't deformed or anything but all I could see was ugliness. That was the night I took my first drink. Not my first ever, but the first one I took to mask my pain. It was a long drink. It lasted a year. It might have lasted forever, but I saw her one more time. I was wandering the streets. Unkempt facial hair, unwashed clothes, and a foul odor that announced my presence long before I arrived. I was a couple of weeks away from being homeless. If you could call my dilapidated studio apartment in the nearly condemned pre-war era building a home. She was coming out of one of the downtown boutiques, bags weighing down her arms, searching her designer purse for the keys to her luxury SUV. I think I frightened her. In fact, I know I did. She was momentarily at a loss for what to do next, shield her possessions or her body. The drunken haze that shielded me from the real world meant she was in no danger from me. It took me far too long to recognize her. The oh, my God, and her hands covering her mouth in shock before she started her car and drove off finally registered several minutes later. A few minutes after that, I stole the beer bottle from the convenience store. That was why I was searching for the bottle opener. I was too stupid to lift one with a twist-off cap and Melanie had rearranged the kitchen utensils again, for no damn good reason. I couldn't find the bottle opener. After the bottle was smashed and the contents of all but one drawer were tossed onto the floor, I found it. There was no Melanie, it wasn't our home, and the bottle opener was right where I left it. Right where it should have been. 
everything had been in its place. I stopped drinking that day and left my hometown the next with a backpack full of everything I owned and almost $50 to my name. It wasn't hard to stop. I wasn't an alcoholic. I was a broken man trying to hide in a bottle. And failing. Is everything an inspirational quote with you now? Not always. Not everything inspires someone. Sometimes things are just a reminder of where we have been. What the hell, Brayton? What does that even mean? I have no idea what it means to you, but, frankly, I have no interest in explaining what anything means to me, especially to you. I wandered for 18 months that first time, walking, hitchhiking, and taking the occasional bus. I worked odd jobs until I had enough cash to move on. Money was tight, but my eyes were open. I put up camp wherever I found myself. There was always some place to lay my head, grab a shower, snag a meal. I indulged myself with the anything that looked interesting from any used bookstore I passed. I could grab a dozen books for the price of one movie. So I read. I wrote down anything that I wanted to remember and anything that I was feeling in an old, worn spiral-bound notebook. It was a diary of pain and discovery. I kept up on world events with newspapers that others had discarded. They were often out of date, but the news that filled those pages didn't really affect me anyway. And I talked to people. Well, listen mostly. People liked to talk and I was a good listener. I splurged once, on a well-used digital camera from a pawn shop. I took pictures so that I could remember the locations I had been, people that I had met, and, much later in my journey, things that had inspired me. About once a month, and for around $5, one of the chain drug stores would transfer all my pictures from my memory card to compact disc. After a year and a half, I settled in a dusty little town in the middle of the country. I worked my first, post-divorce, full-time job in the warehouse of a fertilizer factory. During the day I slaved away, hauling shit, and at night I retired to my rented room above the local garage to read and write. I exchanged my notebook for a used laptop and spent my free days at the local library using their free internet to load my thoughts and pictures to a blog. People followed me, commented anonymously, and, though I was writing as a cathartic alternative to therapy, I enjoyed knowing that people were interested in what I had to say. I enjoyed it a lot. Melanie paused at the only picture that I had of my former family, a strip of photographs from a booth at an amusement park. April was four years old at the time. Her ponytail wrapped in pink ribbons and her newly pierced ears shimmered with the fake diamond studs. The overly bright flash couldn't compete with the smiles on the faces of the three subjects. Each captured the moment. The first was surprised, the next silly, and then genuine laughter. I could help you get in touch with her. Help you reconnect. Oh, so you're close? down with all the latest comings and goings of your daughter. I could see her try and search my gaze for information. It must have been hard for her not to have the upper hand, to not be a step ahead, to be wondering what I knew or didn't know. You should be proud. She's turned out to be just like you. I saw the shock in her eyes at that comment. Something else, too. Maybe regret? She stopped to look at that one, too. I think she was surprised that the images didn't match her memories. Or maybe what she'd been told. It's hard to say, for sure because she didn't comment. I never thought of myself as a writer. In my former life, I was a production supervisor for a large manufacturing company because that was my job title after my fourth promotion. I had started at the bottom and worked my way up. I had never been a writer, never dreamed of writing. But that didn't stop an online men's magazine from listing my blog as one of the best of the web. And it didn't stop them from offering me a first a monthly, then weekly, column. The money wasn't all that great, but doors were opened. Two years later, the email from the publishing company was a complete surprise. They wanted to see more of my work. They wanted to publish my book, which was non-existent at the time. I sent them an almost incoherent collection of essays. They sent me an editor who asked me to write an opening chapter on how my journey began. So I shared my story, for the first time, with an editor. Then nothing happened. Not for a few years, anyway. I assumed that it wasn't good enough. But I kept writing my blog. My column had an increasing popularity. The money was getting a little better, but I was bored. So I left, again. This time heading for Europe. There are no hostels for 35-year-old men. No reduced fare train tickets. But I still crisscrossed the continent as cheaply as I could. I saw the things that I had only seen in textbooks or on television. I visited the places where history and traditions were born. And I didn't stop. From Europe, I made my way to the Middle East, then India. I spent three months in Asia. The languages, the culture, the food were all a new experience for me. I saw what it meant to truly be poor, 
not the shameful excuse that I had cursed. The people were the same though. People everywhere liked to talk. I was 14 months into my latest journey and more than ready to return to the States when another email came with a preview of the cover of my book attached. That is when things got interesting. I flew home to a host of agents, editors, publishers, and lawyers. With the increasing popularity of my column, there was a buzz about my book. I turned that buzz into a fairly significant raise from the magazine, based mostly upon a convoluted ad revenue formula. It was more than I had ever made before and more than enough for me. So, I returned to my hometown to start a new life in the place I had grown up, grown to love, and missed a great deal. Unfortunately, my book was released to an average response. A far cry from what some had hoped. Honestly, I wasn't really that surprised. My rabid blog and column followers probably accounted for 99% of my sales. Unfortunately, the lackluster sales meant that my career as an author was most likely over before it even began. Then he went on television to call my first chapter a bunch of lies. It was a local reporter from my hometown who asked the questions. Was the story in my book really true? Had he taken my job and stolen my wife and daughter and perpetuated lies about me in court? He could have said nothing. He should have said nothing, but he didn't. In most of the civilized world, the story didn't even cause a ripple. But in my hometown, the son of a wealthy businessman and the ex-wife of an author was a juicy tale. And, whether out of embarrassment or arrogance, he overplayed his hand. He sued me for libel and defamation of character. It was all the publishing company needed. They had spent time and money vetting my book and had spent even more time and money on editing and design and production and distribution. So when they saw the opportunity to recoup some of their money, they pounced. They dropped an army of high-priced attorneys and public relations staff on my former employer. I watched from the sidelines. It wasn't about him and me. It was about the controversy and the free publicity that came with it. His actions caused quite a stir, and my book shot up the bestseller lists. It's odd how life works. Some people just never learn to quit while they're ahead. Did you know the board asked for his resignation? Nope. I hadn't heard. I am actually stunned he made it this long, though. Productivity dropped 21% after his brilliant cuts that first year, and 18% the next. Sales were down. Morale was down. Your shithead husband was never any good at running things. It didn't surprise me that she didn't jump to his defense. She never would have taken a bullet for me. Why do I think you already knew? Because you are a cold and calculating and heartless woman. It's really too bad, though, because from the papers I just signed for Julie, I think he is going to need that paycheck. That was your lawyer? She's not my anything. And she's not a lawyer. She's a paralegal. She works for the firm that is representing my publisher. I tried to tell you, it's not about me. Although, I'm apparently going to benefit a great deal. I guess karma really is a witch. I could see the comeback swirling behind her eyes. There were so many things that she wanted to say and wished she could. And I saw her finally conclude that there was nothing left in her tank. That I would have the upper hand in every scenario. I hoped that she would give me the opportunity to use some of the one-liners that I had been dying to use. But at the same time, I wish she would just go away and leave me in peace. So why are you here? That caught her off guard. But she recovered quickly. Oh, now you're curious. No, I just don't understand what it is that you think you can accomplish. I suppose he should be grateful that you love him so much that you were here trying to save the last bit of his crumbling empire. But like I said, it really isn't up to me. I measured her reaction. It was exactly what I expected. But it isn't him you love, is it? It's his money. Oh, the irony. He had it. But now in the irony of all ironies, he'll have to give it me. And you, once again, will have nothing. What? You don't think you can find another rich sugar daddy to screw for money? I think you are selling yourself short. You've still got a hot body. You'll land on your feet. Or, in your case, probably your back. It wasn't like that. I'm not sure I had ever laughed so hard in my life. She couldn't possibly think it was different. But her body language was defensive and her eyes told me she did. I was momentarily taken aback. Could she not know? Was that even possible? Oh my god. You don't know. What the hell is that supposed to mean? I didn't say anything for a while, quickly doing the mental math. But I couldn't find any pitfalls. After months of interviews and depositions and discovery motions, it was all part of the record. If she really didn't know, he had to know she would find out. I wouldn't be hurting the case telling her something that was soon to be public knowledge. You're right. It wasn't like that at all. I am just talking out of turn. It was all innocent. Right? Yes. It was almost a whisper and I considered asking her to repeat it. But I didn't. Sure. 
He was just reaching out to the families of his employees, making sure that everyone was aware of the situation at the plant, making sure everyone was preparing for the worst-case scenario. Of course, he was paying special attention to the most venerable of the group, the mid-level management. We were the most at risk, and he felt his personal attention was necessary. She was listening with intent, but I had no idea what she was thinking. So he invited you to lunch to give you a heads up. Of course, nothing had been decided yet. It was all just preliminary. And every so often, he would give you a call to give you the inside information on how the process of evaluating employees was coming along. Then a few more casual lunches. A few more phone calls. And then he changed his tactics. He poured his heart out. The stress of holding so many lives and the balance of his decisions was just too much to bear. The things he had been offered to save people's jobs were so shocking. Money. Sexual favors. It really must have been shocking for Melanie because her eyes were as wide as I had ever seen them. I walked over to my desk as I talked, searching for the right file. When I found it, I continued my narration. And that is when you sealed our fates. That was the moment that he won and I lost. The moment when your trust in me as a man, as a father, as a husband, as a provider lost out to your greed. That is when you gave him your body and destroyed my entire world. I slid the papers across the table. She stared down at them for a while as if they would burn her fingers if she touched them. I had never actually seen the lists and I always assumed that their existence was a myth. But my publisher's attorneys had combed through thousands of documents revealed during the discovery process. The one she was holding was not all that interesting, except that my name was at the top of the list of employees to keep. According to the dates, it would have been one of the first lists produced, maybe even the first. The second was far more interesting. Sure, the names were the same. But the second list had John Davis's almost incoherent notes, check marks by several names, and my name and one other crossed off with a single red line, mine annotated with one word, Melanie. There was only one other name marked that way. The attorneys couldn't believe he had kept it. Then again, he always was an idiot. The third list was printed on his own letterhead and marked final, and, not surprisingly, my name no longer appeared. Her eyes darted back and forth in a mental query that I am sure provided an answer that she wouldn't believe. And now you're wondering, how could he possibly know all that? She was staring back at me, with her mouth slightly open. Dumbfounded was not a good look for her. You'll figure it out. You're stupid, but not that stupid. You know what I mean. The urge for another drink was strong. So I rose from my chair and went into the kitchen. I dropped a few ice cubes in a glass and pushed it into the refrigerator opening to fill it with filtered water. If I had learned anything, it was never to give in to my urges. Decisions made after careful planning and analysis of the potential consequences were more pragmatic. That, and the fact that being drunk in the same room as Melanie seemed to be asking for trouble. I believe that sex is one of the most beautiful, natural, wholesome things that money can buy. Steve Martin, since we're just getting everything out in the open, I guess I am curious about something. Did you ever love me? Melanie had been staring at the documents for about 20 minutes. After about five minutes, I could see that her grip tightened and her hands were shaking. A few minutes later, her completely stoic expression returned. She hadn't said another word the entire time, so I had decided to break the silence. Apparently, she wasn't interested in answering my question because she moved her head just enough to meet my gaze and then quickly looked away. I would have been paying closer attention to Melanie, but I just couldn't wrap my brain around why she was sitting in my loft. I definitely had questions and I wanted answers but I couldn't even go there because her sudden appearance just didn't make any sense. It hadn't even been 48 hours since Mr. Moneypants' lawyers had requested a settlement conference. My attorney and the attorneys for my publisher had thrown a bit of impromptu celebration that night, seeing that move is all but admitting defeat. But in a world ruled by sharks, these guys were the killer whales. They didn't shy away from a fight, they wanted one, went looking for one, and did everything in their power to make sure they found one. Victory wasn't enough. They enjoyed humiliating people. I am certain that none of them had read my book. Everything I wrote spoke against everything they stood for. And, yet, it was nice to have them around. Having been on the other side of table, with only righteousness on my side, and getting summarily crushed, had not been a fun experience. So, yeah, I could have easily, and correctly, been labeled a hypocrite. But I hadn't started down this path, so I happily went along for the ride. I was lost in those thoughts when I took another long look at Melanie. She was as beautiful a woman as she had ever been. I smiled at the thought that I had been right all along. I had often told her that she would just get hotter with age. I honestly didn't have any idea why she had gotten all dolled up for me. 
She looked like she was ready for a night on the town, or more accurately a night on the prowl, and that's when it hit me. Holy shit. He sent you here. I'm not sure I had ever seen Melanie so angry. In fact, I'm not certain I had ever seen her angry at all. When we had been married, even during our worst argument, she had never been angry. Disappointed? Sure. Annoyed? Absolutely. Scared? More than I apparently had known. It was the main reason her cheating had been so devastating. In an ocean of improbable outcomes, with wave after wave crashing to the shore, in my mind, Melanie abandoning me would have been a continent away. Even now, after years of self-examination and a disciplined and sustained rebuilding of my confidence, I knew I would never be the same. Soulmates never give up on each other. But mine did. Sure, he had to be desperate. The lawsuits and attorney fees totaled $12 million. He was rich, that much was certain, but he wasn't that rich. The Sharks thought, in the end, that judge would award almost $7 million in judgments. They tried to explain their calculations to me once. My book was called Property and had a valuation, and his lawsuit had been frivolous and without merit, and they had amassed a mountain of evidence to prove that he, and his lawyer, knew that very fact. It all sounded like the person spewing the better bullshit was going to win. Still, his mistake wouldn't leave him penniless, but it would be damn close. And, without a source of income, like the silver platter, cushy job he had been handed before, that outcome would be devastating. It was the only thing that made sense. He had sent her. To stop me. In a final attempt to save the only thing that really mattered to him. Money. He needed a wife and a family. Melanie looked up, but still didn't respond. I knew for certain that she had no idea what I was talking about. I had to admire his ability to keep her in the dark. I had never been able to hide even the smallest secret from her mostly because the guilt would have eaten me alive. I guess a conscience wasn't one of John Davis's concerns. A few members of the board of directors started asking him questions. Why didn't he have a family? When was he going to stop with the long list of women and partying? It wasn't that they gave a shit about him, or the women for that matter, but it had the potential to be problematic for the company. You can't have your next CEO caught up in sex scandal. It's bad for business. He just flat out asked Stephanie Carmichael to marry him for the money. Of course, she was banging him for cash, so he probably thought she'd just agree. Stephanie was what most people would call a 304, or at least that was the rumor around the plant, and her husband David was what I called a moron. I never had any first-hand knowledge of their exploits, but I had heard the stories. Most of the time rumors are just that, but in their case, I had always believed they might be true. Stephanie Carmichael was always the woman showing a little too much skin, wearing the outfit that was just a little inappropriate and saying something that could easily have meant something much, much different. Her husband was always the guy talking about what a hot piece of shit his wife was and trying to get guys to admit they were checking her out. I always thought she was pretty good looking for a former daytime stripper. Of course, the contents of her resume might have been just a rumor, too. Still, what would have been laughable stories about anyone else actually seemed plausible for them. One night stands, wild house parties, swinging, pictures, and videos on the internet. I had no idea if any of those things were true. What I did know, for certain, was that David Carmichael's was the other name crossed off the infamous list, with Stephanie's name written in right next to it. And David had mysteriously disappeared immediately following his termination. Also, though I had always thought she was a very ditzy bleached blonde, she apparently wasn't as dumb as she often looked. She has the gift tax records to prove it. Three years worth. He gave her almost 150 grand for the twice a week treatment. Steffi, the name she seemed to prefer, had spilled the beans on Davis's little seduction scheme. She also made no bones about screwing him for money. We had an arrangement. He was generous with his gifts, and I showed him my appreciation as best I could, every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon at the condo that he leased for me. My husband and I appreciated his gifts, but as soon as my Davy finished nursing school and came home, I dropped that fat prick and his tiny tool. She also had no problem giving a very convincing explanation of why he was still picking up a little on the side for years after he married Melanie. I looked right at Melanie as I finished my next sentence. Apparently, he was looking for something he couldn't get at home. Like B-Jobs. I wasn't certain Stephanie had been telling the truth until I saw the look in Melanie's eyes. Then I knew for certain. Of course, she could be making it up. Because that certainly doesn't sound like the woman I married. I could tell she was about to lose it. It had been almost an hour since she had even made a sound. I decided it was if I was ever going to have my pound of flesh it would have to be soon. So what did he tell you when he sent you here? 
He told me to get you to stop the lawsuits by any means necessary. Does he pimp you out often or just when he is about to lose his fortune? He's not my pimp. He's my husband. Hey, no judgment here. I know, firsthand, what that tight little body of yours can do to a man. It makes you believe things that in reality just can't possibly be true. So, when are we going to get to the by any means necessary part of the show? Because, to be honest, the persuasive argument portion has become a little tedious. What's it going to take? She said it with such a lack of conviction. It was the only time that I allowed myself to feel even the tiniest amount of sorrow for her. It was just beyond my understanding. How could someone so beautiful, so full of life, so energetic, have such a lack of self-confidence? How could that person let themselves be used in such a way? For money? Honestly, I understood the appeal at least a little. My favorite chair had cost me well over a thousand dollars. When we furnished our first apartment, I am not sure Melanie and I spent that much on everything we owned. So, yeah, it was extravagant. It was also comfortable as shit. Still, there was no doubt in my mind that I would trade every one of my extravagances to have just one more day alone with Melanie in our dumpy, little, first apartment. To have things be the way they were. I guess that just made us different people. Like I said before, even if I could stop it, I wouldn't. I think you should go home, to your husband, and tell him I wasn't even interested in his offer. Take your skanky bum back to him. Get together and talk about how you're going to get through this rough period in your life. I am certain, with a love as strong as yours, you'll make it through. I watched her. I watched her perfect lips that I wanted to kiss. I watched her beautiful silk blouse peel away from her stunning neckline, ever so slightly, revealing just a trace of her very thin and probably equally expensive innerwear. It took all my willpower not to have sex with her. After all, soulmates never give up on each other. I waited for the tear, but it never came. Oh, sure, the water built up in her eyes and I thought for one moment, she might let it spill over. But she didn't. I had to give her credit, at least for that. Get the hell out of my house. And don't ever bring your cheating butt back. Sex without love is a meaningless experience, but as far as meaningless experiences go, it's pretty damn good. Woody Allen. Our chat had lasted a couple of hours, but I hadn't planned on screwing her. To be honest, I hadn't given it much thought at all. There were too many other thoughts swirling in my mind. The weeks prior to that night had been full of surprises. But she was beautiful. And I was a man. And she did offer. What does a girl have to do to get a refill around here? I took her glass and walked into the kitchen. I refilled it with her wine of choice and returned with her glass and the bottle. I read your book. Twice. I would have responded with a witty comment or a sincere thank you if I hadn't been mesmerized by the sight in front of me. I would have had a better chance at finding my words if I hadn't been wondering what had happened to her blouse, feeling a little bit sorry for myself because I had missed its disappearing act. Fortunately, I was able to watch as she removed her skirt. And I couldn't help but wonder if all those adventures, if all that self-discovery, if all that. She continued as she stood there in her almost transparent black innerwear. See-through material. A fact that was confirmed moments later, when she reached behind her back with one hand and, in a practiced motion, she removed her clothes. Exploration. Would make you better at sex. I've been told I'm fairly impressive. Oh, I have no doubt. We made love, and then I collapsed, exhausted onto her. Her gentle fingers tracing my lower spine awakened me from my blissful rest. Jesus Christ, Brayden. Your ex was an idiot. Oh, Julie. You say the sweetest things. The best revenge is to live on and prove yourself. Eddie Vedder. Julie stayed with me every night for the next four months while the judgments wound their way through probate court. We had sex like newlyweds during her entire stay, though she always said, no matter how spectacular the sex was, she was going back to New York as soon as the lawsuits were over. I didn't begrudge her, in any way. Maybe sharks, with only a few hours of law school left, don't hang around the shallow end of the pool, no matter how many times they come on your meat. Still, the time I spent with her, brief as it was, was amazing. That first night we were together, she had been at my condo, explaining the latest lawsuit. That one from my daughter, who was suing me to save her inheritance. I can't say, with any credibility, that I didn't know that Melanie was angry when she left that night. Furious even. But I can say, that I honestly thought she was mad at me. Maybe for turning her down or for stealing what she rightfully earned on her back. Apparently, I had been wrong. I can't imagine what it must have been like for him. I know I was devastated when Melanie didn't choose me when faced with something as common as a corporate downsizing. But, then again, the coroner's report was inconclusive. John Davis may have never known. 
Hours after she left me, and drunk enough to barely maintain consciousness, Melanie shot him. Once. Right in the tool. Bullet fragments severed his femoral artery. Then she turned the gun on herself. He bled out quickly, they said. She, most likely, died immediately. But no one could say for sure if he lived long enough to know she would rather kill herself than have sex with him when he was poor. I can't imagine what that must have felt like. But I hope he had at least a moment to really give it some thought. Anyway, I spent days being angry at Melanie. Not for me, but for her daughter. As messed up as Melanie was, her daughter needed her. No. April hadn't given me any indication that she and Melanie were close. In fact, probably the exact opposite. Still, she was a lost little girl the one and only time she had come to see me. She didn't remember me, at least the real me, at all. That surprised me a great deal. I thought she would have been old enough to remember. But memories can be replaced by lies when you hear them often enough. She clearly didn't believe me when I said that. Once, long ago, we had been happy. Together. And a family. And now, there would be no one left who could confirm it. One picture on a wall of hundreds, couldn't, and didn't, change her mind. She was bitter at Melanie's funeral, which I completely understood. Unfortunately, months later, it seemed I was still enemy number one, with little hope of changing her opinion. When, the ruling finally came down, and her inheritance was all but lost, she rushed out of courtroom, barely escaping a contempt charge for the profanity-laden tirade she left in her wake. That was the last I saw of her. And, I don't have much hope that I will ever see her again. The bond one hoped we would always have, seemed as fragile as the one that had been between her mother and me. But maybe fathers and daughters are different. Maybe Mr. and Mrs. John Davis didn't permanently poison her against me. And, someday, she'll know that she can always count on her dad for help. Or, maybe, she'll find herself out there in the big wide world. Or maybe find her soulmate. Hopefully, one that won't give up on her. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.